Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by TRX Dinosaurs. They have innovative puppets, poseable sculptures, and animatronics. And you can get all of those varieties of dinosaurs at trxdinosaurs.com. This week, we have Dinosaur of the Day, Nomen Gaia, and a bunch of dinosaur news. But first, we would like to thank some of our Stegosaurus patrons. And this week, we would like to thank Scotty, Jackson, Megan Dixon, Kessler, Tristan Jules, Grandpa Dino, Rhinosaurus, <laughs> Morgan Eklov, and Dr. Eigenbot. Thanks, everybody. We really appreciate all your support. As a reminder, we've now posted the list of all the dinosaur requests that we've gotten. And from now on, we're only taking dinosaur requests from patrons. And you have access because you're patrons. <laughs> <laughs> so you can check out our page at patreon.com slash I know dino. Jumping right into the news, we have a couple of egg papers that I want to talk about because there's some good dinosaur egg action going on in the last couple of weeks. So the first article that I want to talk about is all about how titanosaurs bury their eggs to keep them warm and what that means for a certain group of titanosaurs in South America. And this paper was written by Martine Heckenleitner and others. And what they did is they looked at some of these titanosaur eggs from South America, specifically Sangasta, Argentina, which is in the La Rioja province with a lot of other titanosaur remains. So basically, titanosaurs can't sit on their eggs, so they bury them in order to keep them warm. And we think that's the case because there are really large pores in titanosaur eggs. And in modern birds, for example, with ratites and these like ground mound building <laughs> birds, there are birds that actually bury their eggs nowadays, and they have really large pores in their eggs too. And we think it's because they have high humidity, so you can have larger pores, because if it's low humidity and you have large pores in the eggs, the eggs actually dry out, and then the embryo dies. But if it's buried and it's higher humidity, then you can have these big old pores and you kind of need them to encourage the oxygen flow because obviously when something's buried, it's harder to get air down to it. So yeah, that's a good clue. And then a lot of animals bury their eggs with compost and they do that because then as the compost decomposes, it warms up the eggs that are right next to them. Hmm. But in some cases, it looks like some animals bury their eggs near geothermal activity basically near, you know, plate boundaries or natural hot springs and things like that, where they don't have to bury compost with it then, then it just kind of gets warmed up naturally. Is that dangerous? Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of weird. So these titanosaur eggs <laughs> that they were looking at, they think were buried near some geothermal activity. I think it was just like a hot spring and not really anything that would injure the dinosaurs <laughs> or the eggs necessarily. But it does make it a little bit harder to make a nest there. And they think that because the eggs from the specific formation are about four times as thick <laughs> as other titanosaur eggs. So a regular titanosaur egg is about 1.3 to 2 millimeters thick, which is pretty thick for an egg. It's way thicker than a chicken egg, for example. It's pretty similar to like an ostrich egg, which if you've ever tried to open, you know you need basically a hammer <laughs> or a power drill <laughs> to get into it. But these titanosaurs from Sangasta are about 7.9 millimeters thick, and that's about 0.31 inches. So you're talking over a quarter inch of solid eggshell. It's an incredibly thick egg, and obviously that's a hard egg to break out of or break into. They estimated that breaking out of the egg would be 14 to 45 times harder than breaking out of one of the more normal sized titanosaur eggs. And it would take about 136 newtons or 30.6 pounds of force to break out of. And just imagining a small, you know, basically dinosaur embryo pushing with 30 pounds of force seems pretty unlikely. <laughs> so the researchers think that they probably couldn't have broken out of that type of an egg. And then the obvious question is, why would the eggshell be so thick? It takes a lot of extra resources to make an eggshell that is so thick. And if the baby can't break out of it, what is the benefit? It's pretty weird. So the hint is that hydrothermal fluid or compost 
basically a lot of times hydrothermal fluids contain sulfur, chlorine, or fluorine. And if you combine that with water, you end up with sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, or hydrofluoric acid, which are very strong acids. And one of the easiest things to dissolve is calcium. So that's what eggs are made out of. And that actually turns out to be the way a lot of caves are formed. These sort of natural springs that are a little bit acidic get into the calcium rock and just carve out big chunks of it. So anyway, if you're going to put an egg there, it's not it's really not an ideal place for an egg in terms of chemistry, but I guess it is an ideal place in terms of the temperature because then they get incubated sort of automatically. Mm. But what the researchers are saying is they think that what happens is they bury the eggs here and then that acidic hydrothermal fluid <laughs> dissolves about 80% of the eggshell and gets so it's it easier to hatch. Yeah, exactly. It gets it down to about two millimeters thick, which they think is the thickness it needs to be for the baby to be able to burst out of it. But I think it's crazy because not necessarily a theory, but the idea of laying eggs in this place, because how are you going to get that just right? If you do it a little bit too thick, the baby's not going to be able to break out if you know if only like 60 or 70 percent of it dissolves and then if 100 percent of it dissolves you've got a hole in the egg and the baby's going to die so it's like such a difficult balancing act there they it, lay enough eggs i guess so but it, it just seems like the odds of getting the right amount of acidic water on the egg and it being that consistent i don't know it's just it seems weird to me i wonder if they didn't talk too much about it, but I wonder if maybe the acid etches in like little lines in the eggs a little bit. So it might weaken it structurally, even if it doesn't get 80% of it removed. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's a pretty crazy one though. <laughs> yeah, If you just thought about it as like a thought process, like I'm going to lay my egg next to this sulfuric acid rich hot spring so that I don't have to incubate it, but I'll just make the egg extra thick and then it'll probably wear down to the point where it'll be able to hatch. Can you say that about most life forms and how they reproduce though? I suppose. I don't know. Most of these nesting behaviors are a little more consistent. Like you put it with some compost and then it keeps it relatively warm. It doesn't decompose that much of the egg and then out pops the baby. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they didn't have compost available. That was the problem if there wasn't enough forest debris sort of stuff to bury with it. Mm -hmm. They had to know. get creative. Yeah, exactly. The other egg paper that I want to talk about was written by Shana Montanari, who we used to talk about a lot. She used to publish a lot of dinosaur-related papers, but she hasn't had much lately, maybe because she was working on this paper. Well, I think she got a new job recently, too. Ah, uh, that makes sense. So this is basically a review of different egg papers all across everything. So modern living animal eggs, all the way back to paleontology eggs and dinosaur eggs are obviously in the mix. And one of the coolest ones in it, we talked about way back in episode 49, <laughs> which is a couple of years ago now. But basically, we think we might be able to determine dinosaur body temperature by looking at the chemistry of eggs. So we talked about it briefly in that episode, but basically there's something called clumped isotope geochemistry. And at the time we called it the paleothermometer, which is a much catchier name. <laughs> and what it is, scientifically speaking, is a delta 47 value. And that's it's called delta 47 because that's the combined atomic mass of three of the atoms in one of the molecules. And specifically, it's carbon-13, oxygen-18, and oxygen-16. And both the carbon-13 and oxygen-18 are heavy versions of the isotope. So basically, there's a couple extra neutrons on it. And the reason that's important is they found a connection between the ratio of this delta-47 value and the temperature at which these calcium-containing minerals form. And so, in other words, as the temperature of the dinosaur laying the egg <laughs> increases, the amount of these heavy isotopes go down. So we can look at the ratio of these heavy isotopes and kind of guess at the temperature of the dinosaur. And in egg terms, that means the temperature that the dinosaur was while the egg was forming inside it. So the mom, mama dinosaur laying the egg, that temperature we can sort of measure. 
And as an aside, apparently this technique also works with teeth, which is really cool because teeth are ubiquitous. We just find them everywhere. Like we find spinosaur teeth all over the whole world. <laughs> Not true with eggs. You know, it, it's a little harder to find eggs. So Especially if they've been cracked. <laughs> yeah. Just have pieces. <laughs> yeah, true. But I mean, if you get a piece of an egg, you could probably still do this. But you wouldn't know what dinosaur it is. A tooth, you can tell what kind of dinosaur it is. And then you could see kind of the body temperature of that type of dinosaur. Mm -hmm. Whereas an egg, they just say like, oh, it's an oversaurosauroid kind of thing. Or like, <laughs> just like that. it's a sauropod. Unless there's an embryo attached. Yes, that's pretty rare. But yes. But since you mentioned there being a, an embryo attached, they did find an embryo inside a eggshell at one point and did a similar sort of analysis to figure out what the temperature was. And they estimated that oviraptorosaurs were close to mammal temperature. Hmm. But then this more recent paper from 2015, I think that first paper was from like 2008, they looked at both sauropod eggs as well as oviraptorid eggs. Those are kind of the types of eggs we find the most common, I think. Um, the oviraptorid eggs seem to be quite a bit cooler than the sauropod eggs. So the oviraptorid eggs were kind of in the range of a cold mammal to a warm reptile. It wasn't, so they, they were saying maybe it's like a mesotherm or, you know, like a warm ectotherm, cold endotherm sort mm -hmm. of thing. But then the sauropods had body temperatures that were really close to modern mammals. So basically like our human temperature, mm -hmm. you know, like roughly 100 degrees Celsius, 99 degrees Fahrenheit sort of range. So pretty warm. And a good indication that they were probably endothermic or warm-blooded in common parlance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I thought that was pretty neat that they found a way to estimate dinosaur body temperature. It's a hard one to figure out, but yeah. the kind of clever things you can do with teeth and eggs is amazing. What will they think of next? I don't know. I hope they apply this to some more teeth because I really want to know the body temperature of a Spinosaurus. I think it could be interesting with the comparisons to crocodilians and mm -hmm. stuff. Because people are always like, maybe it's just like a crocodile. And if it had a body temperature that was really similar to a crocodile, right? that would be fascinating. So in some other news. Non-egg news. Non-egg news, <laughs> but still exciting. Especially for this kid. It was this nine-year-old Ashton Roswell who found a dinosaur bone on the Isle of Wight in the UK while playing on the beach. Nice. Nah, that seems to happen a lot. And that means, I think, according to UK law, he probably got to keep it if he wanted to. Oh, I couldn't find any details on that. But the reason he found it is pretty cool. He's been watching YouTube videos about fossils. Hmm. And then when he saw it, he thought, oh, this is something. And it turns out it's an iguanodon vertebrae. Oh, cool. Yeah. That means he probably gave it to a researcher if it's been identified. Yeah, I think so. Nice. But there wasn't a whole lot on it, but... That happens a lot. You've got kids, or I guess we've heard about kids and their grandparents. They're low around. to the ground, <laughs> so they're closer to the fossils. Or they're looking. Yeah, that too. Yeah. Playing in the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> You've got some exhibit news. Brown's Farm Barn in Pennsylvania has a free fossil exhibit called Unearthed. It's open on Tuesdays and Saturdays this month in July. Only two days a week? I think so. Hmm. But... It's cool. The curator is Scott McKenzie. He's the assistant professor of geology and paleontology director at Mercyhurst University. And these fossils, they come from private owners, so they're on loan. They're also from the university's collection. And people have found these fossils when they're gardening or farming. Hmm. So, yeah, just kind of doing their own thing and they find something in interesting. In the dirt? Yeah, in the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> So they've got, it's not just dinosaur bones. They've also got a mammoth skeleton, dunkleosis bones, a cast of a T-Rex tooth, a skull cast of a hadrosaurus, and then a lot more stuff. And the curator, Mackenzie, he's going to be at the exhibit as often as he can to answer questions and examine new finds. Maybe that's why it's only open two days a week. He's got to carve two days out of his schedule to sit around the exhibit. Yeah, <laughs> or questions. somebody that he works with if he can't make it, I think. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, that's really nice. That is a thing you tend to run into more at smaller museums, mm -hmm. which is kind of strange when you think about it because these big museums have so many resources and everything, but it, sometimes you want to talk to somebody, there's nobody around. You go into these small museums, the owner, person who found the fossil, yeah. and guy running the shop are all the same person. 
and then you can talk and to get them. Get all the details. Yeah, yeah. It can be really fun to go to some of those smaller museums. There's another one. I think it's in the same county in Pennsylvania. This is in Sandy Township in Dubois, Pennsylvania. They're going to have a new dinosaur exhibit sometime soon. I couldn't find too many details about when, but this person, Dr. Jeffrey Rice, has a real estate holding company property and plans to have a showcase for displays with animatronic dinosaurs and 10 full-size fiberglass dinosaurs that kids can climb on. Hmm. But no other details yet. Interesting. Yeah. A lot well, of stuff going on in Pennsylvania. In I think it was Erie County specifically. <laughs> There's a lot of people in Erie County. Yeah. It's near Ohio. Very popular spot. And apparently has a lot of fossils. Yeah. Cool. Moving east. <laughs> <laughs> in Chelsea, Massachusetts, there's a brewery called Mystic Brewery. They're relaunching a beer this fall in honor of the, oh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this wrong, the Sagus orange dinosaur. Could be Saugus too, maybe. Yeah, it's this, the famous orange dinosaur in Massachusetts on Route 1, which we've definitely talked about. And people who work at this brewery pass by it all the time, and so they made this dinosaur beer for <laughs> it back in March. It's a That's double, cool. yeah. It's named Orange Dinosaur. It's a double <laughs> IPA. It's got an orange color, aromas of mango and passion fruit. I guess that also kind of gives it the orange color, or at least you know lets it be orange. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the beer's coming back in November. Cool. Mm -hmm. I want you yeah, actually now thinking about it in Massachusetts. They leave out tons of sounds from their words so it could just be like saw or like suh oh or i don't know if anyone's listening from massachusetts <laughs> please tell us how to pronounce this it's okay it'll <laughs> probably never come up again you never know in november it might i guess when yep. the beer comes out yeah <laughs> <laughs> now in canada in drumheller alberta which is the home of the royal tyrol museum there's a new metal dinosaur on display that's called locks of lovasaurus <laughs> And it was made by welding shop students and recently installed outside a restaurant called Bernie and the Boys. And people can hang their locks of love on it, which, you know, this is really common to do on bridges. Oh, it's that kind of locks yeah, of love? it's the actual lock I thought it key. was the hair donation thing. No, no, no. It's, <laughs> you know, you can write something on a lock and then lock uh... it to something. Except they, apparently there's a suspension bridge in Drumheller that they do this with but then they have to cut off the locks every mm -hmm. once in a while because it's too heavy and then it gets dangerous but then this locks of lovasaurus it's meant to always hold the locks oh really yeah that's interesting i wonder if they'll be able to hold to that or like what it'll end up looking like if there'll be locks attached to locks attached to locks as it gets oh. totally filled oh no what if it falls over it'll look like a dinosaur that's just getting buried in locks over time <laughs> <laughs> or yeah, weird or lock over. skin yeah. Oh, that's kind of weird. I guess not that many people go to Drumheller with the intent of locking things. So maybe it'll... Depends it'll if okay. you pass by this restaurant. True. Yeah, it wasn't there when we were there, that's for sure. Otherwise, we probably would have done it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we would have added to the weight. <laughs> yeah, none of the, the bridges we've been to that have it were that appealing to us. But a dinosaur, I think that would that would get oh, us... Oh, I did uh, the Brooklyn Bridge once, but you weren't there. Oh. <laughs> I'm sure it's long gone by now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Next, thanks to Sarah who shared this one with us via Facebook. There's an online shop called Love Pop that makes pop-up cards, and they have three Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom cards available of a T-Rex and blue and a Pteranodon. Mm. Yeah, it costs $15, kind of Oof. pricey, but they leave it blank so you could use the card for any occasion. Yeah. So if you're going to give someone a $20 gift card, you give them a $5 gift card and the card. <laughs> $15 card, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much they'd appreciate that. I I think I'd probably enjoy it. Yeah. It sounds like they're cool. Yeah. No, they are very detailed. I'm impressed. I'm always impressed with pop-ups. They're probably laser cut or something like that. Oh, I think a lot be. of those pop-up cards are like that. Pretty neat. Different kind of pop-up. Next, Japan has a pop-up Jurassic World themed restaurant. Hmm. So from now until August 6th, it's going to be in Tokyo. And then from August 10th to September 30th, it's going to be in Osaka, and people can eat at the restaurant. It's to commemorate Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Oh, cool. It's like officially licensed, or? It looks like it. Hmm. I couldn't figure it out for sure, but based on the pictures, because all the meals are basically dinosaurs from the movie. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, there's a Jurassic World burger, and 
the, the picture I saw was kind of confusing because the description was the plate looks like it's scraped by a raptor, but it looked like the picture was a, like the bun was a raptor face or something. Huh. I couldn't, but then it also looked like maybe that was a dessert, not a burger. I couldn't tell. Mm. <laughs> yeah, something might have gotten lost in translation there. Maybe. There's also a volcano curry. Mm. It looks like a mountain's exploding next to a salad. <laughs> the salad's like a jungle, then the mountain's got the curry lava. There's something called powerful wild plate. It's got raptor footprints. Mm. For dessert, you can get a fossil excavation cake that has a brush, so you can brush it off. <laughs> and there's a dinosaur egg cake. It looks like a baby dinosaur is about to hatch. Oh, and you can get dinosaur lattes. These were impressive. They have illustrations of T-Rex blue or a Mosasaurus on it. I couldn't figure out how they got because those were so detailed. Although, when we went to the Fukui Museum and they had their dinosaur lattes, that was pretty impressive too. Yeah, but that was just kind of a general sort of silhouette of a sauropod, I think. Yeah, these are actual, I think it was colors on it too. I couldn't remember. Maybe they have something sort of like a one of those shakers or those sifters mm. with holes in it, and then it's just like cinnamon that they just puff oh, down in the shape of a stencil or something like that. It's very detailed. I no idea how you'd do that. Yeah, it probably wasn't with steamed milk or anything like that. Yeah. So all of these things, and they have other desserts and drinks, really pretty and really well done. It's too bad it wasn't there when we were there. I know, we just missed it. <laughs> <laughs> And before we get into our dinosaur of the day, Nomangaya, we're going to pause for a word from our sponsor, TRX Dinosaurs. And Nomangaya is very special in terms of TRX Dinosaurs because they've actually already made one. A really pretty purple one. Yes. <laughs> well, it's not all purple, but it's got a lot of purple. There's some pictures of it when it was a work in progress on their Instagram at TRX Dinosaurs. And then there's a really cool video of when it was almost done. And it's kind of going around so you see the whole thing. And it looks like it's smiling. Mm. <laughs> it looks so happy. It's got this large uh, orange beak and then kind of purple feathers on top and uh, also white and black. It's just really cool. Nice. Yeah, it's got really cool feet, too. The feet are always my favorite part. And it looks kind of <laughs> happy because it's got that, you know, it's almost like a circular head, like a Pac-Man. Yeah. Where it's like split in the middle with the beak, and but it's got an open mouth and it just, it looks happy to me. I really like it. It does look happy. <laughs> so yeah, TRX Dinosaurs, they make, as you know, animatronics and puppets and sculptures, and they're all scientifically accurate, which is, I think, what makes it really special. Mm-hmm. And that anybody can order them. You don't have to be a museum to get one of these really high quality pieces. Mm -hmm. Although you can be a museum and get one of these <laughs> as well. And if you're interested in getting one, head over to trxdinosaurs.com. It doesn't have to be a Nomangaya or Nomingia, depending on how you like to say it. It can be any sort of dinosaur because they make everything custom order. So head over there and let them know what you want. Yep. And also follow them on Instagram at trxdinosaurs. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Nomangaya, which was a request from Keegan. So thank you. And just as a quick reminder, we have had so many dinosaur requests lately that we do have to close it down for now to only people who are our patrons. And if you are a patron, go to patreon.com slash inodino where we have details on how you can access all the dinosaurs that have been requested. We will be going through all the ones that were requested from non-patrons before, but but patron requests are prioritized and new requests must come for patrons. So quick reminder on that. And now back to Nomangaya. It was an oviraptorid theropod that lived in the Cretaceous in what is now Mongolia. And it was medium sized, is about 5.6 feet or 1.7 meters long and weighed 44 pounds or about 20 kilograms. It had this pygo style tail with five fused vertebrae. It probably had a feather fan. Yeah, that's what basically modern birds have is they have that pygo style where their tail feathers poof out like you think about an eagle or a hawk or something they have that little v-shaped thing or a peacock yeah i mean I that's, that's a pretty extreme, extreme example <laughs> <laughs> but yes they do also have a pygo style if you really wanted to think of what it might look like <laughs> i mean i don't think we've found what the feathers around the pygo style looked like on nomangaya so maybe it was like a peacock <laughs> you could <laughs> Guess. I was just saying as an example of pygo style. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of buried under the feathers on that one, though. Yeah, and it's 
the Nomangaya tail was shorter than most dinosaur tails, so I guess it probably wasn't like a peacock. <laughs> well, that's the pygo style in general. It's like a few vertebrae that are fused mm. as like a short tail rather than just the long, you know, 40, 70 vertebrae oh, things sticking see, way I out see. there. Oh, I see, See, now I just have peacocks in the <laughs> in my head, so. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Nomangaya could have used its tail for display where maybe one bowed towards another and raised its tail. And then the one with the largest and best developed tail would be considered the most attractive, which I actually, I think that is like peacocks. Yeah. And before Nomangaya, this bone structure was only found in birds, the avium dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Nomangaya would not have been able to fly, but it did have a beak and probably had a crest for display. The holotype was found in 1994 by the Mongolian Japanese Paleontological Expedition in the Nemet Formation. They found a partial left leg, pelvic girdle, and most of the spine, and then it was described in 2000 by Barsbold and others. There's only one species, Nomangaya gobiensis, you know, because Mongolia. <laughs> the name refers to where the fossils were found, and Nomangin Gobi is a nearby part of the Gobi Desert. Oh, yeah. That really makes me not know how to say it. I'd assume the Gaia was like Gaia, the earth spirit sort of thing, but it's named after a place that's in Mongolian and it's also been Latinized. Mm -hmm. So pronunciation is anyone's guess. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So in many of these cases, we just do our best. (laughs) Yeah. They very rarely give you a pronunciation guide in the paper. Yeah. So, yeah. But Nomen Gaia or... Nomingia, or however you want to say it. It's unclear what it ate. Other dinosaurs that lived in the same time and place include the Ornithomimosaur gallimimus, the Therizinosaur therizinosaurus, the Hadrosaur saurolophus, the Ankylosaur tarkia, the sauropod nemectosaurus, Dromaeosaur adosaurus, the Troodont xanabazar, and Tyrannosaurs such as Allioramus and Tarbosaurus. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in that Nemect formation. Mm hmm. And a lot of it is really cool. A lot of the most popular dinosaurs outside of Hell Creek. Oh, like yeah. Velociraptor, too. It's somewhere in the mix. Might not be that close, though. A little farther out, maybe. Gallimimus is pretty cool. Yeah, that's a good one. Also, the Therizinosaurus is just a weird <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah, it's a winner. <laughs> <laughs> and our fun fact of the day is that some dinosaurs that sat on their eggs may have had to frequently turn the eggs while they incubated them which is something I've never thought about before. Mm-hmm. But appara- Just like when you cook eggs. <laughs> oh, that's one way to look at it. I was thinking how modern dinosaurs, also known as birds, turn their eggs while they're incubating them. Uh, but I guess you can talk about eating their babies if that's what you're into. Oh, well, <laughs> and you put it like that. <laughs> so modern birds apparently turn their eggs about every 30 minutes for the entire day and night. Just the whole time they're brooding. So they just don't nonstop. sleep? Nonstop. Yeah, it's really weird. I guess penguins don't sleep. Yeah, um, maybe not. <laughs> but emperor penguins have the longest brooding. It takes about two months for them. Hmm. But I don't know if they have to rotate their egg or not, or turn their egg since it's on their feet. I don't know if they can move it much. Maybe they just kind of shuffle around a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then some birds can be as little as two weeks, but still two weeks without really sleeping much would be rough. Maybe they do it by instinct too, and they don't actually have to get up. I don't know. The way researchers discovered this was they snuck in some electronic eggs into the nests (laughs) of some birds because you can't really see what's happening under the bird, Mm -hmm. like how they're turning it. Because apparently they do a lot of this with their feet, not with their beak. That's how I imagine they would turn them. Hmm. And they noticed because of the sensors and the eggs that almost all the birds were turning them every 30 minutes. So twice an hour, just nonstop, day, night. They thought maybe the nocturnal ones would turn them more at night than the ones that were only awake during the day. But they were all doing it all the time. So very attentive parents. Yeah. The researchers also know that this is very important because basically of the chicken industry. (laughs) So if you're brooding chickens on a huge scale, they have automatic egg turners Hmm. that they have in the brooding chambers. And they turn their eggs about once every two hours. Oh, that doesn't seem like enough then. Yeah. I mean, the ones that they tested them on were all like sea fowl sort of things like gulls and I think like an albatross or something like that. So maybe chickens are on a little bit less frequent of a schedule or maybe two hours is just often enough and birds do it on the safe side and turn them a little bit extra. Mm -hmm. 
they think that the reason that they need to be turned is to help kind of mix nutrients into the embryo. So there's that albumin, that white part that Sabrina likes to eat when she's cooking her eggs. (laughs) (laughs) See. (laughs) But embryos also need to eat that while they're inside the egg. And so they think that maybe this mixing helps. There's some chemical tests that they did too, and they saw that eggs that weren't turned as much didn't seem to be getting the nutrients quite right. Hmm. Also, apparently you can't just shake the eggs because it damages the embryo. So you have to be pretty sensitive when you're doing it, you know, move them gently Mm -hmm. because otherwise too much movement is going to injure them, but not enough movement and they don't get the nutrients. It's a balancing act. They do that with their feet. Yeah. I really don't understand how this is possible. And also, I don't know how dinosaurs could have managed this with their huge eggs and their huge feet. And the claws. Yeah. Like, well, I mean, birds have pretty big claws too, Mm. but you're right. I don't, it's nuts. And then I'm thinking maybe some of these dinosaurs didn't do it because obviously the dinosaurs like titanosaurs that just buried their eggs, they don't have to worry about it. They're not getting turned at all. They just throw it in a pit and forget about it. And a lot of modern animals do that too. They don't always have to turn their eggs, but most modern birds do, at least the ones that contact incubate them. So I'm wondering if the dinosaurs that did contact incubating had to turn them or not, or maybe it was some kind of in-between realm where they were contact incubating them, but they weren't turning them. And then the eggs just took a little bit longer to hatch or didn't quite get the nutrients as quickly as modern birds do. Hmm. I don't know. It would be really cool to see like a gigantoraptor stirring its feet underneath itself (laughs) to move the eggs around. I wonder if you'd notice it more than you would in a modern bird because it's so big. Yeah, I think you would. (laughs) Yeah, especially if they didn't have enough feathers to kind of cover up where they were stirring them up. Or maybe they use their mouth more. Like that recent paper with, I think it was Despletosaurus, the Tyrannosaur, where they said it had sensitive skin or sensitive scales by its mouth and they you know, we're proposing different reasons it might have had that. Maybe it's for shifting eggs in a nest, Mm. but I don't know. A tyrannosaur foot seems like it'd be pretty hard to push around an egg gently. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Also, it seems like the feet would have thicker skin or something to protect it. And how do you feel? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would they be sensitive enough? That's Mm -hmm. a good question. Maybe we'll figure out a way to determine this at some point. It seems like a tricky one to establish though build a robot gigantoraptor foot with an electronic egg. (laughs) Yes. Oh, you could see if it was plausible, yeah. Yeah. But then whether or not the egg needed it at all. Well, I don't know how you do that, but yeah, it's a good point. (laughs) (laughs) And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And check out our page at Patreon at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again and until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.